So yeah, you can go ahead. Hello, everybody. I'm um, Pamela, and as Ben Cat said, um, and I do refer to him as Ben Cat, not Dr. Ben Cat, um, because I'm just Pamela. So I'm not Dr. Pamela or anything fancy like that. Um, look, I'm coming to you from um, from Darwin in my home in Darwin. When, and Darwin, for those people who don't know, is at the top western end of, this, of, of Australia. It's close to, very close to Indonesia or and East Timor. So, and I'm saying namaste to all of you and that I'm really pleased that I could join you now because I, the body, the, the spirit was willing to get to um, go to join you in Hyderabad, but the body said, nah, uh, you need to, you need to stop. So this is the best way to do this, to do this. And so I'd like to start by saying that I'm acknowledging that I'm on Larrakia country and Larrakia is the name of the traditional owners of, of Aboriginal traditional owners for this part of Australia. It, it comes, so um, people may not know, but Aboriginal, um, there, there are, um, if you look at a map of Aboriginal Australia, you'll see that there's, there's hundreds of traditional lands where people um, have um, cultural and spiritual responsibility for preserving and protecting the land. So I want to acknowledge I'm on this land, on the Larrakia land. I want to acknowledge the elders, past and present, and I want to acknowledge that as a colonised group of people, they have never ceded their country. So it's in a, in a sense. So I'm recognising that as a as one of the descendants of some of the earlier um, white inhabitants of Australia. So um, when when it asked me to join you to 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 be this, provide this guest note, thank you, and to looking at with the theme of hope. Have in post post pandemic, I actually thought because my background is mostly in working in, in trauma, and I'm a trauma survivor myself, and I'm also um, I'm very I'm a trauma survivor myself. Plus, I'm I've also had many many decades um, of working with trauma survivors, and I've written a book on on recovering and and, and finding a way. To triumph over trauma. So this, well, this little presentation I want to give you today is is not it's not going to be an academic one. It's going I'm going to be speaking from the heart and looking at a kind of spiritual or philosophical approach to finding hope and wellness and well-being. To do that, and if you if you look at the abstract, the, the bit that I'm referring to is I'm looking. What I'm doing is is I want to share with you my strategies and knowledge and experience by tuning into our own innate um, capacity to heal towards finding hope, wholeness and well-being in a post-trauma world as a testament to our innate, innate capacity to heal. In it, and I say that in recent years because many of you will probably um, know about and are very, probably very experienced in in post-traumatic stress disorder and knowledge of that, where where there's the um, the brain has been uh, the human brain has been programmed to to survive for either the fight, flight, or freeze. So with the, the with the traumatic response of post-traumatic stress disorder, there's another part of the brain which makes sense really that is actually programmed human brain to heal. And in recent years, I, I have sorry, I, I haven't got the name of that that specific name of that part of the brain but it's it's actually programmed to heal um which stands to reason because if you think that if we're going as a species we're going to be walking wounded we're not going to survive long enough to have actually evolved into the people we are today or who we might be so we've got to so say that my the bit that i've discovered both in my own journey and in working with many many clients in their own recovery journey from trauma, because I focus not on treating post-traumatic stress disorder, but on, on, on treating and on working with people in a holistic way for achieving what I call post-trauma recovery, and which includes actually reclaiming a sense of self, and in some instances, rebuilding a sense of self that's never been allowed to grow and flourish. So that's where I'm coming from. So in, in deciding this, I, 
um, I'm, I'm going to share with you some some part of myself and my stories and, and not my journey out of trauma, but my journey, the lessons that have helped me to do this. And the first one, um, I want to tell a little bit of my, my mother um, married my father when she was just 18, it was in the middle of the Second World War. And she she was a she was a what they call here a, a, in up here a, a salt water person. She came from the sea. She came from the, the coastal areas of New South Wales, at southern, just just north of Sydney. And her, all through her life and childhood, she had quite a troubled childhood, and she found refuge by walking with her dogs on the beach. So when she married my husband, my sorry, my father and she married him, he took her into what my mother describes as the back blocks out west, out into the country rural areas of New South Wales in the country where there were only rivers. So, but every Christmas holidays, whenever we can, we would be going back to the beach. And because mother so loved the beach, she actually taught us some strategies about how to safely swim in the water. Now, I'm sure that in your cultures that you will, and in your different communities, um, you will have some pretty solid knowledge about what's safe, unsafe, where to go, what not to do, how you approach different things. So mother, so in a sense, learning to read the environment, to navigate, safely navigate the physical environment. And that's what mother did to us. So before we actually were allowed to enter the water, we had to stand there and have a lesson. But can you read that? Can you see how how that way the water's going out and it's flattening the waves? That's a sign there's a rip. And a rip is something that takes you out and it's a current that comes out and washes out and you'll end up way beyond the waves. So that's it. You avoid that at all costs. She also told us that if we happen to get caught into a rip, you don't swim against it because that will just tire you out. You actually swim with it and slowly move to the side because eventually the rips are usually very narrow. So you can do that. So she taught us how to do that. And then and then she taught us how to um, not body surf. I've never I've never not to surf as in surfboards, but and nor even to Daughter, she taught us how to read the waves. So she would take us out and, and how to, she would take us out and we'd see the waves. And we were little kids um, at that stage. But, and she would take us out and she would teach us and she'd say, watch the wave, see what's happening. Is it going to break on top? Is it going to come to you close? Is it going to break on top of you? If it's going to break and you can swim, because we could all swim, swim out and you can either dive under it and it'll break over you and you can come up the other side and you'll be right. But if it's going to break right on top of you, you just go to the bottom and just let the waves break over you. So and so to do that, so by the time I was 12, when on the holidays, I'm, I've been this height and this, not thinner than I am now, but I've been this height since I was 12 and I was fully developed physically. So I used to spend hours out in the surf because I would read and I'm out there. I couldn't, I couldn't touch the bottom. I'd be out there beyond the depth and I'd be swimming and I could, and I'd watch the waves and I'd not only watch the waves that was coming, that was coming to me, I'd actually, as I cut, I'd love to swim. I'd swim like mate crazy to get to the wave before it break. So I'd get up and I'd go zooming down the other side, which was really fun. And as I zoomed down the other side, I would actually find ways of having a look what's coming next so I could be prepared to do things. So in a sense, so and there, and so I learned how to ride, metaphorically speaking, she taught me how to work to what to to, to to surf the waves of life. It, which is really tragic in lots of ways because she was a very damaged woman emotionally and so she had a lot of mental health issues that made her made life for her and for me as a daughter very difficult but that was an inherent lesson that I've never forgotten so when we talk about um then Kate talked about post-traumatic a uh, post um post um pandemic trauma I actually like the word use the word tsunami I know and that I can recall back in, I think, 2005 or six, 
the big tsunami that wiped out so many of the communities in Sri Lanka and across eastern India. And of course, Arche in, in, in Indonesia. What I, that's, and this is the bit I want you to see and experience that when we're on a traumatic, when we're experiencing trauma, it is very frequent that we get, get the feeling that as we've actually over our heads, over our heads, we can't touch the bottom, and the waves keep coming at us, wave after wave after wave of drama, and that, that keep buffeting us around and things. So one of the lessons, and that, and I actually start, so as I grew up and I've had five or six major incidents in my life, which could be classified as traumatic incidents, some of them ongoing, this sense of actually being able to find a way to ride out the wave, a wave after wave of devastating impact of both the trauma and its after effects, because it's not just the event itself, there can be the dreadful turmoil and swirling that happens, which is very symbolic. A wave breaking is very symbolic. So I learned to do that, and that was very important. Um, and the other thing I learned to do was that because we were inland and we used to go down to the river, mother taught us how to ride the rapids. So she had to look again, how to look at what was happening with the red water, how to read all of all those. So that they were very important lessons in my life and things. So I'd like to pause a moment now and just ask you to think in your own life, what lessons have you learned in your life, as indirect as they may have been, by, like my mother's, which have ha may have helped you deal with some very painful and traumatic events in your life. And I'd like you to take note of those and to actually sort of hold them close and recognise that, that what without knowing we had hold within us a capacity not just to survive but to find ways to rise above or to rise over or if we get dumped to find it, it, how to come back up again and draw breath, which is different from the post-traumatic stress disorder situation. Another lesson that my mother taught me was the, the sense of believing in, in, in self. If, if and believing in ourselves and who we are, do we know who we are? When I left when I left home at 17 and three months to go to university, my and I had to travel 600 kilometers or 300 miles from my country town to the university in Sydney. My parents gave me they they said to me, my mother said, whatever you do in life, be true to yourself. So she, again, she didn't know really what she was saying, but she actually sent me on a quest to actually get an understanding of who am I? Who is self? What do I need to be true to? How do I understand what is self and what isn't it? What's my imagined self? And so it's that sense of a spiritual connection to who I am and more importantly, where I fit in life because frequently trauma disrupts that. It shatters quite intimate connections and when, if we if we lose our sense of connection to self that makes the capacity to rise above the waves or to find and to find hope it makes it so much harder i'm currently working with a woman who's 55 and she's been through three major um two db episodes and one other episode of trauma and i've only just discovered that she has, she's only just learning at 55 to who she is because as much as her mother was a very caring person, she was never allowed to think for herself. She had to, she, and she was always, she was the goody goody in the family and she didn't have, so here she is, cast adrift in life. She's escaped the two domestic violence situations, horrific as they were, she's escaped them. So now in life at 55, she's standing there wondering, who am I? Where do I fit? And slowly we are putting her, helping her to see that she's actually been doing that 
all along, but she's done it under the surface because to bring herself out in either domestic violence situations or with a mother who was had a very good idea of how she should be as a teenage girl and things and how she... The mother's At 55, her mother's still telling her how to brush her hair and whether she's cleaned her teeth. You know, so it's that kind of relationship. So I'm wanting you to think about to the extent to which you have a knowledge or if you how your knowledge and belief in self may in fact be sustaining for you to help you have a, a kind of, if you're not grounded, at least have a knowledge that you can float and find somewhere a foothold in your life that can actually steady you, help you draw breath and gain energy and maybe even rest a while to do that because that's one of the other things I discovered. I'm, an uns I'm unsinkable. I can literally lie in the water float up, put my hands behind my back, put my feet up, and I float. So I I, I cut, I, unless something comes and drops on me, I don't sink. It helps to have a, a lot of female buoyancy, I think, to, to help to do that. So that's actually, that again is a lovely metaphor for me, that I know that I can actually take time to rest, even in find some quiet waters where I can rest to do things. And each of these gives me the capacity to endure and to stay and to get breath and to take breath. Okay. The other things that I told you, I talked about the rips and things, but the other thing I've learned to do, and I, 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 in, in my life, I've literally, when I first went to India in 1983, I, I bought a ticket with Air India from Sydney and landed in Mumbai in um, three o'clock in the morning. I had nowhere to stay and I just was confident that I, I thought, oh, well, I'll just bring up a hotel and I could do that. I was confident that I could find my way around. And most important, I actually believed in the people. So I wasn't frightened of going into an alien world. In fact, that's what I was relishing the prospect of. Of going there, so as we, so we got, I got to it, but on the plane over, I met up with an Australian guy who was travelling. So he said, "Oh, I've got my, I've got my accommodation booked. You could share my room with me, and and I'm well, going to be in the YMCA in Mumbai." So we rocked up there at about four o'clock in the morning, and not only was it that they had, didn't have any record of his prepaid booking, the place was booked out. So here we were walking around the streets of Mumbai at three or four o'clock in the morning. We, and we, it was just behind the Tart Hotel in Mumbai, right on the water. So I said, all right, let's go. We'll go see if we can walk into the Tart Hotel. So we trucked up to the Tart reception and they had a huge international conference on. No comment. We ended up, so we're walking around the streets of Mumbai in the middle of the night where the racks were as big as cats and I was very conscious all the people sleeping on the streets. And I really felt bad about them disturbing them with things. But we found a nice little spot. The cockroaches were as big as mice, but the, we found a place where we could sleep and it was safe and things. And not once do I, did I feel in, at risk. And it was about, so one of the other things we've got in our brain, which has, comes with, is our ability in our brain yes, to yes, actually risk. Sorry, Ben Cat. So, so, so it's about using our brain. So when we're in, we to use our brain to assess and navigate and hopefully mitigate risk, so we can move forward with confidence, and to do that, and we can explore new horizons because when we've been experiencing trauma, we can't stay where where that is because that means we get stuck and mired in the trauma and the trauma reactions, we have to find a way out of the out of the mold, out of the mud, out of the murk to find a new way forward. And so I so that was the other thing about looking at being able to believe in oneself and to be alert and to trust and to think, all right, and to draw on knowledge that we have, that we can find a way through through this. But importantly, one of the other things that I think is that I've all, I, in all my travels and I, uh, around the world um, and through life, I've actually always found encountered people 
who would be there. They may not be able to support me, but in a myriad of ways, they might be able to contribute me. I might be able to just, they might just give me a little bit of word of encouragement. Sometimes they've actually given me a, foot, a foothold, a foot, helped me to have a foothold. But I'm just, so I, I'm, I'm conscious of time. So I just want you to share with you and encourage you to think about your capacity um, and, and, and look at how, how you could, oh, if, you're, if it's not your own, how you could work with other people to actually explore that inner capacity for life and to grow and to continue to grow and develop through the ages of who we are and to do it with a great sense of joy and flourish. So I say thank you. So Kriya. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pamela, for that uh, wonderful short, in fact, a very lucid uh, explanation of uh, almost a lifetime journey of your own, plus the concept of the way you have dealt with it. Hopefully, this will uh, uh, you know, open up a conversation in the conference immediately. Thank you. And all the best. Namaste. Have you finished recording, Vicat?